Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion, has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the highest chess rating in history. But uh, given what you've said about the psychology as well, how do you think Magnus Carlsen would fare over a 24-game series with Garry Kasparov in his prime or Bobby Fischer in his prime? Um, there are actually two, que two questions in one. One is about inflation of the ratings. One is about uh, relative strengths of the different, of the different uh, players. Now, starting with the second question, I'm not comfortable of trying to put Bobby Fischer or Capablanca or uh, Batvinik or Kasparov against Magnus Carlsen because, you know, it's like trying to I'm compare different scientists, you know, like Newton and Einstein. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to save you the trouble of this. So when Magnus won the world championship the second time, he said two, da two down, five to go. And I think to match Gary, and okay. I think that's I about where six, we are. Yeah, six matches, six world yeah. titles. Uh, uh, now, it's every generation is getting more sophisticated because we learn from the previous generation. So that's why Gary Kasparov at his prime was a player who, in, let's say, in 1990, was not as knowledgeable about opening theory and about other things as Magnus Carlsen today. If you give me, in 1990, theoretically, a chance to learn about everything that happened in the next 25 years, so that would be a different player. So that's, that's, it's, then you compare talents. Same with Bobby Fischer. So Bob, Fischer in 1972 knew probably less than any average grandmaster today, so what? And that brings us to the rating system. Yeah, Magnus has the highest rating system, which is natural because, you know, the, there are more and more players, you know, the whole pyramid has been growing, and more players on the bottom, you know, they create a sort of the, the, the higher pyramids on the top. Uh, I had for 13 years the highest ever rating was 28.51. But I wouldn't compare this to Bobby Fischer's 27.85 in 1972. Today, Fischer would be probably you know, in top 10 only. I don't think that you know, that's, that's his real position. Uh, when I crossed 2800 mark in 1990, there, were only, there was only one player in 2700 kind of category, Anatoly Karpov. Today, there are 50. So that's, that's, it gives you an idea that you know, it's, it's all they the ratings. They actually did inflation deliberately yeah, it's, no, it's at one time early just, on, natural. so people it's, felt like they were getting better. They, I'm serious. They yeah. actually did that. They stopped that. But uh, anyway, no, we'll, we should take another, uh, some more questions. Um, Rabbi Stuart Altshuler, we have a big mess in the Middle East. And I want you to reflect on the damage, in my view, perhaps you disagree, uh, that Obama created when he didn't respond to Putin's support of Assad in Syria and, and the mess that's building there in the Middle East with Iran, with ISIS, and the whole part of uh, that global situation. Well, um, look, I, it's not I said, you know, it's, you can look at my Twitter, you can look at my Facebook, you can look at my interviews. I was furious when Obama drew this red line and then just walked away. You know, it's responsible of US president to protect the integrity of the office. And I'm not here to argue whether it was a right idea or he was right or wrong by actually having this red line, red line in the first place. But if it's there, you can't talk anymore. Somebody crosses, you shoot. It's just, it's, you did it already. And I argued, and I was on a few TV shows in, in, in America uh, having debates, that said the consequences of Obama doing this will be felt not only in the region, but way beyond that, because every stock in the world was watching Obama and recognized that he was weak. I think that helped Putin to make a decision to, to invade Ukraine, because, okay, well, just as the guy keeps talking. So it's this, uh, Obama always tries to hide behind Congress in foreign affairs, which is not typical for America. So it's this, normally US president, you know, is fully responsible for foreign policy actions. And, um, uh, you know, you can see the ISIS rise. It's very much the result of the failure of the mission. So Americans fail to actually finalize all these arrangements there. I don't think they could, but definitely they could. They to could, to they be could. fair, it goes back to what you said about we invaded in no, a it's very just, ignorant no, way exactly, earlier, yes. and then but you know, but you know, in chess, in, agreed. You know, I think it's the invasion of Iraq was a mistake. But in chess, we have a simple rule: the bad plan is better than no plan, <laughs> because at least you can learn, you can you know adjust. But if you have no plan, you know you're dead. So that's that's a, it's a disaster. And uh, also regarding Iran, it's just, they have rely, they keep saying that Russia is important partner. Russia, important partner. It's just, 
it's as if there's a common ground to, to negotiate. Because, yeah, I can, I can imagine, you know, these, even American presidents 40 years ago could negotiate with Soviet Politburo. But at least, you know, we knew what was the end game. And there was certain compromise that could be reached. The problem, you know, by, by dealing with Putin on Iran is that there is no compromise because the goals are totally opposite. Putin needs, what, high oil prices, correct. That's the only way for him to survive and get cash. How you can get high oil, price, uh, high oil prices? You need tension. Where? In the Middle East. So Putin's strategic interest is to make sure that Iran has been will be developing nuclear weapons forever. Maybe ideally we'll even get it. So the, there will be ISIS, there will be other terrorists, this Hamas will attack Israel. As long as the tension is there, he has a chance of oil prices being high. Now, Isn't he pretty exposed through the republics and, you know, of ISIS coming up and radical Islam coming up, you know, through some of the former Soviet republics? No, okay, but Shouldn't he worry about that? That's, it's, too, you know, too many moves ahead. It's, it's, exactly, it's chess, you know, <laughs> this is, this is, somebody who's playing poker, you know, this is, it's, he ends this game and then he'll start another one. But right now he needs high oil prices. And also, you know, when you look at, at, you know, Putin, ISIS, Iranian mullahs, what brings them together? It's, they treat free worlds and especially the United States as enemies. Because for them, you know, this conflict is, is, the, is the main rationale for being in power. They need the enemy. So uh, it's, we have positive agenda. And the globalization created many opportunities for businesses, so for technologies. But it unfortunately also created opportunities for bad guys. Because now they can recruit crazies from around, around the world. And while we, we're trying to, to, to confront them with positive agenda, they have only negative agenda. Because the strengths of all the thugs as being judged by their followers by the caliber of the enemy. So that's why they always attack us because they know that the success of a liberal democracy and market economy means the end of their rule because it will destroy the... the uh, you no, know, it's uh, a huge difference between exactly, China, uh, exactly. China and Russia. China thinks, rightly or wrongly, that it's winning if it's patient, and Russia thinks it's losing if it's patient. It's yeah, okay, well, China's, you know, but China's let, leaders... Let, let me move on to a couple okay. more questions. Old Soviet Union, there was, of course, was notorious anti-Semitism against Jews in many areas. Did this extend to chess? And would it have been possible for the Soviet Union to have had a chess team without the Jewish influence? I doubt very much because, you know, I, I think that's most of the chess players in the Soviet Union, uh, definitely before me. So, yes, it's slightly, it's changed in the 70s and 80s, but the majority of top players, when you look in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, were of Jewish origin. So, and uh, again. And, and you had one of your parents was uh, Jewish. My father right? was Jewish, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but um, it's, you know, um, the anti Semitism in the Soviet Union uh, could, could be easily combined uh, with, you know, with the great minds, you know, of Jewish origin, you know, sort of uh, being uh, on top of uh, cultural uh, or uh, sport pyramid. So we had musicians, you know, performers, artists chess players, scientists. So, uh, and that's, that's this, the, this, the Soviet regime uh, had an ideological agenda that required the talent. By the way, that's the difference with Putin. He doesn't care. So this is, today's Russia doesn't need, you know, any more, you know, uh, any more of intellect. So that's why the wave of the immigration in the last five years is, is as high as after 1917. So people just leaving the country. And when you look, at the at the um, at the quality of people of the country, you can understand. You know that's that's the that's that's a government's policy. So they 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 have a huge wave of immigration from Central Asia, and they have immigrants. So that as a leaving the country, and those people who can you know who could uh, contribute to sort of Silicon Valley. Okay. What are your political ambitions and aspirations? Because you're talking, obviously, a lot of common sense to most of us in this room, but how can you use that to influence world political affairs? Uh, tell me about world political affairs or uh, Russian? Or, Russian. or both. Uh, actually, if political ambitions, I would say none. Uh, I, you know, I just believe that by, if, you, if you say things that make common sense, as you said, you know, it especially at the time when you could use social media and uh, you can communicate the message even back to Russia, despite the fact that all TV channels blocked for you. Um, you know, at a certain point, you know, people 
just start listening. Um, I'm doing it in America as much as I can, in Europe, in my native language, in Russian. Um, and I'm, you know, I still remain optimistic that uh, uh, you know, the human race you know, doesn't deserve Putin's of this world to, to be there forever. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's too dangerous for us to, to have these you guys around. So eventually, even in Russia, common sense will prevail. And I'll be doing everything I can to make sure it happens rather sooner than later.